Well, I'm Aziz. Um, it's nice to see some of you again. It's been a while. And we've been continuing our work with the so-called immortal worms. Um, and since those first set of videos came out, a lot of people have been in touch asking about how do we know whether these worms are really immortal. So these are planarian worms, flatworms, that live in free living, uh, they're free living worms that live in freshwater lakes and ponds. You can probably go to your local park and if you have a pond or a river, if you go to the river's edge and the bank, hopefully you'll be able to find some of these worms. The reason we use them in research is because they have amazing powers of regeneration. They have a, a population of adult stem cells and this population of stem cells allows them to regenerate. Um, and some people refer to them as immortal. I think the best demonstration of that is to show you um, the regenerative capacity of one individual worm. So in there, I've got a population of worms, boxes and boxes, that I can show you, that all come from one worm that has been cut again and again into smaller pieces. But literally cut like Yep. We've taken a worm and we've cut it into several pieces. Each piece goes and regenerates a whole new worm, and we can just keep doing that. So now that, that's really the, bit, the best demonstration that they might be immortal. And this led to a guy um, uh, in, the eight, in 1814, a guy called Daliel, referring to them as immortal under the edge of a knife, or almost immortal under the edge of a knife. So in here we have our stock of planarians, flatworms. Um, and we keep our stock here so when people want to do experiments, they can come and take worms, take them to the lab, and do various things with them, chop them up, inject them, knock out genes, look where different genes are expressed and what they do. But the stock that we have, uh, that we work with mainly, came from one individual worm. So I'm just going to show you, at the moment, how many worms we have from that one individual. I have to promise not to play the Benny Hill music, right? We need to speed it up. So I'll start moving soon. All from one worm? Yep, all from one worm. Well, they're going to be clones of each other. So um, during their normal life cycle, the animals actually, when they get to a certain size, fission naturally. All we've done is speed that up for convenience. So every worm in here, because it came from one individual, should be a clone of the original worm. Bear in mind that mutations may have occurred during cell division and DNA replication, um, so that some of these individuals might have acquired differences from each other. But essentially, yes, they're going to be uh, clones of each other. So it's a shame you can't see any, but often you, you see them on the side, stretched out, ready to fission. You sort of see them on the edge of the box and their the head's pulling away from the tail. The first worm, the progenitor, the, you know, the mother of all these worms, how did you choose that one? Was it, was it a special time or did you, was it just a very arbitrary, okay? It was arbitrary, yeah. We just picked one worm that we had um, from a stock sent to us from another group that's been working with these worms for a lot longer than we have, and we just started cutting it. That first worm was probably cut into three, and those three were cut several times, and so on and so forth. So this is one demonstration of how the worms are immortal. We can get all these worms from a single individual. It'd also be, like, be possible just to keep one animal happy. It shouldn't die. It should just respond to food, grow a bit, shrink a bit when it doesn't get any food. And as long as it didn't get infected with anything, it should live forever. But of course, we'd like to test that. So as scientists, we've got slightly higher standards of proof um, so one way to prove they're immortal would just be to stay here forever and just watch an individual worm and just show that it kept living and keep looking after it. Unfortunately, that's not really practical, at least not for an individual scientist. So there's other ways we can try and test whether um, these worms are immortal. So if an animal is immortal, there's a certain things that it must be able to do. Okay? So for example, with human beings, we get older. So our ability to heal, our ability to... Uh, replace our skin cells, gets worse as we get older, we get crinkly, start to get uh, creases under our eyes, etc. Um, and part, part of that is because as we get older, our ability to replace our aged cells like, um, uh, decreases. And the way we replace our cells, just like the worms, is from, for, is from pools of stem cells. So we have stem cells just like the worms. But there's a big difference between our stem cells uh, in, in our bodies and the worms. The stem cells in the worms appear to be able to just keep dividing on and on without any limit. 
as you can see from the number of worms, that, the, that those are all, that those, that all those worms have come from individual worms growing from, from cuts, making new worms, and they eat and they get bigger, and then you can cut them again and make more worms. So those stem cells keep dividing. Whereas we don't do that. We, we get fatter and thinner during our lifetime, but generally we get older and older, and eventually you know, old age is basically a lack of our body's ability to keep repairing the normal damage, the wear and tear that happens during our daily lives. But humans go on forever, don't they? We do kind of re reproduce and more of us exist mm -hmm. like the worms. So what, so what that is, that's sexual reproduction. So the way we reproduce is we have egg and sperm come together and a new embryo develops and a new individual forms, gives rise to new life. Part of that process is rejuvenation of the stem cells in a sense. Um, so in a sense, if you like, our germ lines, our, st our sperm and our eggs are in a sense immortal um, because they keep being used to reproduce, make new animals, and so on and so forth. Um, these worms are asexual. The worms I've shown you today are asexual in the sense that they don't go through that bottleneck of having an individual egg cell and an individual sperm cell come together. They just have a pool of stem cells that can consistently rejuvenate the animal. So what, what we did is we sat down a few years ago. We made a list of things that we would expect an immortal animal to be able to do in terms of molecules. So we go down and look at the DNA of these animals and how the DNA is maintained, there are a list of criteria that must be true for the stem cells in these animals to keep going to allow them to be immortal. And we kind of put them in order, temporal order, of when they would become a problem. And the first one, in terms of temporal order, is the ability to actually maintain the length, the ends of DNA, inside the cell. So in all animals, whenever a cell divides, the DNA needs to be replicated. So if you imagine if I just take this piece of string as a, an example, as a model of DNA, and DNA is, has this string shape, which is obviously tied into a double helix, and during uh, cell division, we need to make an exact copy of all the DNA in a cell. And this DNA process essentially involves, if I get another piece of string, getting an enzyme called a polymerase and just copying the DNA along. Okay? But there's a problem with that process and the mechanics of the process, uh, which is quite complicated. But essentially what it means is that you need a piece of DNA at the end to act as a primer or a beginning point for this poly polymerase to bind and synthesize new DNA. And as a result of that process, what actually happens is the very end of each string of piece of DNA, each chromosome, doesn't get replicated properly by this mechanism, and so you lose it. As we get older, and our stem cells in our body keep dividing, the DNA at the ends of the chromosomes gets shorter and shorter. The reason it isn't bad news is because all animal chromosomes have protective structures at the end, which consist of sequence that, in a sense, doesn't matter so much because it doesn't code for genes. And, and these structures are called telomeres, um, and they're maintained by an enzyme called telomerase. So there's a balance between telomerase activity, which re-extends these chromosome ends, and cell division. So as cell division occurs, these telomeres, these special structures get shorter, and then telomerase comes along and makes them longer again. But there's a limit to the extent to which telomerase does this. Um, and that's very important, actually, for human aging and human health in general, and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, but essentially what happens in stem cells is that you get, um, the chromosome end gets to a critical length, and the cell decides, well, that's it, I'm not going to divide anymore. Because I've reached this critical length, and if, if this end gets any shorter, I'm going to start damaging genetic material that is important. It decides, well, the only way to cope with this, actually, is to stop dividing. And that's because in those cells, telomerase is no longer active to keep relengthening the chromosome end. One theory of human aging is that aging is a result of the loss of chromosome ends, resulting in the ability of stem cells to keep, they, they actually lose the ability to divide. So in, in, in cancers, for example, where cells keep dividing, um, it's almost nearly all cancers, 90% of cancers, have actually reactivated the telomerase enzyme when they shouldn't, and these cells keep dividing. So if you like, aging is, can be seen as a balance in some, in some respects between aging, okay, you want to live for as long as you can, but you also want to avoid cells that divide out of control. And the way to control that is to put that length limit on. So we sat down and thought about the worms, and if they're immortal, they must have a method for overcoming this, uh, this problem. So they must, have a, they must 
have a way of keeping the ends of the chromosomes intact. And if they don't have this, they probably can't be immortal because the chromosomes' ends will get shorter and shorter and the genetic material eventually would be damaged and they would not be able to keep going, right? So we hypothesized, this is what you sit down and you think, well, how can we test this? We hypothesized then that these animals would have a method of indefinitely, as in forever, potentially forever, maintaining their chromosome ends. And we went and tested that idea. So the way we do that is we actually went and looked in these animals and looked, for, looked at two things. One is the activity of the enzyme telomerase and whether it's there at all and whether it's able to maintain the chromosome ends. And then we also measured the length of the chromosomes. And what we found was really exciting. We found that if you had a worm and you kept it in culture, but you didn't cut it and you didn't allow it to, to fission naturally, the chromosome ends just get shorter and shorter. And for us, we take that to mean it's aging, which is obviously bad. But if we then take those worms and we, we allow them to fission, so we allow them to regenerate, or we cut them, so we artificially cut them and let, make them regenerate, the chromosome ends actually recover and get longer. So these animals have the ability to rejuvenate their chromosome ends, which is what we'd predict if they were immortal. So one of the criteria they would need to fulfill for being immortal worms has been fulfilled. So we're really happy with that result because it, it fits in with our ideas that these animals might potentially be immortal. So this, the, the skill which uh, uh, my graduate student, Thomas Tan, developed um, was to be able to measure, measure two things. One was the actual length of the telomere structure. And to do that, he had to essentially take worms, which he knew the age of or he knew how long it was since they last regenerated, and grind them up, run their DNA the, telom the, the DNA which corresponded to the telomere ends on a gel and take a probe, a radioactive probe, and throw it on that, on, on, on that DNA. And that allowed him to measure the length of that end structure. And I can actually show you, if you like, what that looks like. Between my fingers, you can see here um, one of our animals that hasn't regenerated for about three months. And we've taken that animal and we've cut it, let it regenerate, and then measured the telomere length again. Yeah, so Thomas, when Thomas first came to me and showed me some of these gels, some experiments, I just thought he'd got them the wrong way around. Because obviously they don't fit with what we would necessarily expect of an animal which has a lot of cell division, an animal that's getting older, we'd expect the telomeres to get shorter. But this is what so, you expected. Well, you yeah, it was very surprising to get such a clear result. So my first reaction to him was, you've just loaded it. You've loaded them the wrong way around. So here you've sort of getting got young and old, you've got old and young essentially. And of course, he had to go back and do all the experiments again and convince me that uh, this is what he was seeing. Um, so that was a eureka moment, yeah, for me. Th so those first videos were made in 2008, so that's four years ago now. And the questions that some of the people asked, like, are they really immortal? Are you sure? Were part of the impetus for doing this work. So obviously when I went and went to give talks, formal talks to other scientists, but also talk to the public, and also the feedback from the YouTube videos was that, well, are they really immortal? How do you know? And it was kind of a circular question. And we thought, well, there must be a way, if we sit down and think about it, we can actually get some way towards either proving or disproving that. And this is really the first step that we've made, theoretical step we've made towards proving that, the, the empirical da the data that we've, we've collected. So in a way, the, 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 the viewers kind of help because we probably would have shied away from this question um, because it's quite a difficult one. It was, it was pretty hard work. To, to do this work. So we would have shied away from it, but actually a lot of the feedback we got from, from sort of public engagement was that, you know, can you prove it? And so we, we, we've gone some way towards that. The public drives trends and fashion and pop music and films, so why not science? Science can be a part of that world. I mean, obviously there's also there's the, under, there's the major goal, which is to find out things that are useful or find out things that advance our knowledge in a way that underpins human health that underpins medical research, like the work that we do. But I think the public can also be involved in science in a, in a very active way and become interested in science in the same way they're interested in all these other things. Why not? I don't see a problem with that. Because obviously it makes you think that if 20 people write a comment, so are they really immortal and have a little discussion about how you could prove it, how you couldn't pr prove it. I mean, however naive some of them are, uh, that's, that really, as a scientist, you'd have to take note of that and go, well, lots of people seem interested in this. So maybe this is something we should do.